Hello everyone, this is Chiang at the Pacific Asia Travel Association, the Department of Sustainability and Social Responsibility. The COVID-19 crisis has highlighted many threats facing biodiversity, living habitat and protected areas. The health of humans, animals and ecosystems are all interconnected. Just protected and conserved areas are key to maintaining healthy ecosystems and protecting diverse natural habitats and wildlife. Tourism is recognized as an important driver of habitat protection as well as a source of revenue generation for protected areas and conservation work. The current COVID-19 crisis has provided us with clear evidence of how behavioral changes can really make an impact, just representing an opportunity for accelerating climate actions and habitat protection. However, with the economic priorities outgrow the environmental concerns of government and businesses during this challenging time, how can recovery packages deliver on both economic and environmental goals? Today, Pada spoke to Suwana Gollet, the founder and CEO of the Wildlife Alliance, to examine the impact of COVID-19 and the direct implications for tourism industry regarding climate and habitat actions in a post-COVID-19 world. The Wildlife Alliance is the leader in direct protection of forests and wildlife in tropical Asia. Wildlife Alliance has also partnered with Yana Ventures and the Minor International Group to secure an 18,000 hectare nature land concession within Bottom Sakur National Park in the Cardamom Mountains, Cambodia. In 2017, this ecotourism venture initiated and opened the Cardamom Tented Camp to help provide the local people with a sustainable model of income generation. Parts of the revenues go to Wildlife Alliance to manage ranger protection within and around the nature concession. Hello, Suguana. Thank you so much for your time today. And we are very excited to have you with Potter in this interview. So to get started, would you mind introducing a bit about yourself and the work you are doing with the Wildlife Alliance so that our audience can know a bit more about you, please? Hello, Trang. Wonderful to have you. Very honored to be interviewed. Uh, I am Suwana Gauntlet. I'm originally from San Francisco, and I have come to Cambodia as part of my nature conservation work. When I saw the, um, the scope uh, of the devastating illegal wildlife trade in Cambodia, I knew I had to do something about it, and I came to live here permanently for the last 20 years. Uh, including uh, helping the government protect the largest remaining uh, mainland rainforest called the Cardamom Rainforest Landscape. And so that's that's our work. We do, we protect on the ground. The Cardamom Tented Camp is one uh, area of our work. It's in the yeah. south of the Cardamoms. Mm -hmm. We are also protecting the middle and the north since 2001. We are protecting a total of 1,300,000 hectares. So in acres, that's way over 2.5 million acres. It's an enormous rainforest, and it is very costly. Um, traditionally, we have been supported by individuals and foundations, so private foundations, as well as governments. So that would be European Union, uh, USAID, US Fish and Wildlife, and a group of private foundations. Uh, for tourism, the Cardamom Tented Camp is supported by a minor group, uh, the Elephant Foundation. For Shintamani Wild, which we are also uh, protecting, and when we say protecting, it's not just around the lodge, it's also a very large patrol quadrant where the rangers go overnight and, and patrol uh, very vast uh, areas of the rainforest to stop also land grabbing. So the Shintamani Wild Ranger Station is supported by the Bill Bensley Collection, uh, by the Wild Collection. Uh, however, for the rest, we are now benefiting from our long years of efforts in developing Carbon Red Project, which is selling uh, the carbon of the cardamom rainforest to polluting industries in the West, mostly in Europe. Thank you so much, Suwana, for the short and sweet introduction. Uh, so we all know that right now, the COVID-19 crisis is affecting every single aspect of our life. 
So um, why is it important to prioritize habitat protection during the time of COVID-19, in your opinion? Well, I think it's more important than ever before to prioritize habitat protection in these times of COVID. Um, we have had several pandemics of which COVID is the worst. And many people around the globe are now talking about the cause being the shrinking of the natural habitat of wild animals. And we have more and more contacts now between human populations and wild populations. This is unnatural and undesirable. We are not meant to have them as pets nor to eat them. This is a serious problem in Asia and at Wildlife Alliance. We are fighting this because we are saving from trafficking to wet markets every month, hundreds of live animals. In about a year, uh, we save an average of 4,000 live animals going to wet markets. And we're talking from everything from bats to pangolins to um, uh, small cats, carnivores, uh, civets. This is snakes, turtles, and this is extremely unhealthy. Uh, these animals are held in squalid conditions, topped close to each other in cages, without food, without water. And this is a time bomb for human health. So far, um, what are the biggest impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on your organization and your operations? Our operations have not suffered from COVID. Um, we are disappointed actually because we, we were hoping that because of COVID, the illegal wildlife trade would stop, that people would stop eating wildlife. Uh, we have consumers here and we also have enormous amount of exports from Cambodia to Vietnam and China. Most of it's smuggled illegally through the borders. Well, that has not stopped. And our rangers on the ground in the forest are not only not seeing a reduction in poaching, they're seeing an increase. Uh, more people are poaching wildlife. And it's going to the extreme that not only are we dismantling deadly snares and traps on the forest ground, we are now finding electrocution uh, metal, metal lines going over a, one kilometer. So all the animals going to drink in the river at night are caught. It's even very dangerous for humans. New types of homemade guns are coming out, made with PVC plastic, with explosives, uh, with cans, gas cans. So COVID has not slowed down the illegal wildlife trade. Thank you so much. When we look at the tourism industry, what are the different opportunities that tourism industry can bring for fostering habitat protection actions, in your opinion? Uh, well, thank you, Tron, for this question, because I think the tourism industry has a huge opportunity and perhaps even responsibility for habitat protection. And I might answer your question with a, a two-prong answer. The first prong is that um, thanks to tourists, it's a very positive comment I want to make, tourists from all around the world have uh, come to the Cardamom Mountains that we are protecting and have demonstrated to the Cambodian government since 2004 that people care about nature, that people will come from countries far away, Australia, New Zealand, South America, US, Europe, to see the last untouched rainforest of Asia. They, they come, they even stay three nights and three days. It's, it's very um, heartwarming to see, especially the youth. They come backpacking now, it's called glamming. Well, they'll come to places like our cardamom tented camp. They'll come to the community-based ecotourism place. They'll tent uh, at night under the stars. They really, really care, and they do great postings on social media. So that's one thing I think the tourism industry is important in uh, publicizing and attracting people from all around the world to help in the protection of these great, these last great wild habitats. The second point is um, it's, 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 it's a danger, I think, a challenge for the tourism industry uh, when you we see here in Cambodia and I've seen it in China also, very large investors come in and they see this forest and they, 
and they they want to put millions and millions of dollars in their investment but their view is to clear the forest replace it with cement put animals in uh, caged safari parks so people can come up and see the animals close up take photos sleep in a five-star hotel play golf uh, go to swimming pool and leave so there really is no interaction between uh, nature and that aspect of tourism if not the only aspect that I see is destruction and pollution uh, we are fighting we're always fighting against those big developments which we have one right now a mega city is planned that will destroy mangroves wetlands Melaleuca forest dense evergreen forest to be replaced with dozens of uh, recreational parks uh, golf courses uh, five-star hotels condos and it's we're in the midst of the battle if we talk about ecotourism which is very very popular in Southeast Asia as you know especially in Thailand um, there are many uh, locations that are very attractive where you can go and you are in thatched roof uh, bungalows bamboo uh, the their low low use of electricity their solar uh, all the water is recycled so it's very environmentally friendly however these facilities often exist in a vacuum because when tourists want to go then for a trek in the in the rainforest or they want to go through the wetlands there aren't any there is no nature left that's why our project the cardamom tented camp in the heart of the cardamom mountains is so popular because not only is it exactly that it's ecologically correct it has solar it recycles it doesn't have aircon but you can take a trek for several days in the rainforest you can see wild animals you can you can go along the river and not see any any human populations so it's um i think for us our lessons learned is that true ecotourism that truly benefits both tourism and nature is where there is a, a wonderful marriage and unity between a facility that's ecologically correct and its natural environment where um, tourism serves the purpose of conservation people come from all over the world and they can visit nature and they understand the purpose of nature and they also their revenues go to supporting the ranger protection which will be my last point uh, one that's not very well understood I think in the tourism industry is that it, they think that it's enough to give jobs to local people for them to stop dangerous practices such as logging poaching and burning the forest well that is uh, based on our experience it is not reality a reality is in addition to giving jobs which is essential you still need the rangers doing law enforcement and you need to support financially those rangers uh, with food with salaries with life insurance with equipment so they can actually stop the illegal activities and protect the nature that tourists are coming to see so there, there's one village for example that we are actively protecting for the last 10 years called Chipat and it's community led and if there had been no rangers to protect the forest the tourists today would be coming to see burn forest no more wildlife it's it's really a marriage that has to happen between the ecotourism and the wildlife law enforcement thank you so much for all the sharing so um moving forward how can we encourage uh, various tourism industry actors to participate actively in habitat actions and maybe you know come up with more of the initiative like the cardamom intensive camp um i would say first that uh the, the foundation for this is to partner not only like minor with yana but minor and yana are partnered with us with with wildlife alliance so it's a tripartite alliance we bring the forest land and the protection they bring the investment and the tourism management so i would i would encourage other outfits to do the same to partner with their local conservation ngo 
to make sure that some revenues from the uh, from the lodges are actually there to support the law enforcement of the rangers and it's a self interest uh, action because if they do that they will be conserving the wild populations and nature around their lodges um, so it's a win-win situation it, it's a bit costly in the beginning because you have to put out the money to protect but after the reputation of the lodge is established uh, you have more people coming than you can even welcome so it's really good for the bottom line i think this goes against um like a preconceived business model where you know you, you build the lodge and that's already a big cost yeah so supporting ranger protection around the lodge is more expensive and it's not integrated into the business plan usually almost usually and and i i would like to say that that's why business plan should be five years and the ranger protection cost because it is a cost needs to be integrated into that five-year plan and with a return on investment that will not happen if the wild populations of rare and endangered species become extinct. In, in the cardamom tented camp, you can see species you can see nowhere else, like fishing cat, like pileated gibbons, uh, like exotic storks coming from Tonlesa, uh, all sorts of things you can actually see them because the rangers are protecting the land and the habitat.